turn in your Bibles this morning to the uh, 10th chapter of Luke. Um, we truly, uh, we truly, uh, again, Patty and I appreciate the, the gifts that you give us. They're way generous every year. Um, but seeing the Lord work among us is the thing that really... Um, that's the gift. It's a gift from God as well as from you to see Kurt back from Haiti today to uh, see. I don't, I don't know if I've saw, well, Harlow's back from, uh, he's kind of been going down to Colorado Springs to a camp doing some work. Um, Patty just finished a five-day club at the school this last week. Uh, the Truth Seekers have been uh, doing projects here and there uh, around the church of ministry, as well as coming to just a plain old hour of Bible study. We had five weeks of, what, 15, about 15 kids most of the time, um, middle school and high school. What a, I mean, those are the thrilling things, and there, there are many, many more of those just kind of going on all over the place. I hope you're participating and seeing some of those and reveling in the work of God among us and looking for more, praying for revival that God will use us in a great way. Well, we're in, we're in Luke chapter um, 10. And one of the ways that the Lord prepares us for this is in his word. And as he in Luke 10, as we've been looking the last few weeks at him sending out the 72, not the 12 as he did in chapter nine, but now 72, to go before him to prepare the way for Jesus. And we said this is not just for them, this is by application the commission that he gives to all of us as believers in whatever place, in whatever career, in whatever situation in life we find us, we have an overarching goal, which is to prepare the way for Jesus to the lives and hearts of other people. That's why we're here. That's what gives meaning and purpose to our life, right? And so, as he does this, we've looked so far at the commission that he gives, kind of a summary of it in verse one. We looked at the challenge. <laughs> Hurt me, I don't know how it did you. <laughs> the challenge of the commission in, uh, in verse two, that, they're, that the harvest is ready. The fields are plentiful, but the laborers are few. And so we are to, Thirdly, the commands, pray and go, pray and then be partial answer to our own prayer. And then the conditions, we can expect persecution. He promises that. We can expect persecution and therefore we must travel light. We must remember this is not the end place. We're not here to see how much we can pile up. We're here to see how much we can give away in the name of Christ. And so that's where we've gotten so far. That brings us today to begin to talk about the communication of this commission. How do we communicate it? Look with me click quickly at verses 9 through 12. Jesus says, as they are going, heal the sick in it, that is in any town you come to, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town, and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Let's pray. Father, uh, as we come to this passage once again, we need your help to discern and to see what it is you would have us take away from this today. Lord, we ask for you to be our teacher and our motivator and our instructor and in how to do what it is that you've called us to do. Thank you for your presence here. Lord, thank you for the privilege this morning of praying for those who are being persecuted for your name around the world, being reminded that that's truly going on. Will you please fill our hearts with compassion, not just for those who are suffering, but for those who are imposing the suffering because they do not 
know you. Give us a compassion for all lost people, starting with those right across the street from us, in our community, in our state, in our country, and in our world. Lord, uh, that we could not take a breath without breathing a prayer for you to take over hearts and lives. Bless us as we look at this word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the communication. When you take the witness stand, uh, if you're in court, first thing they ask you is a question, right? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? And uh, you probably say yes, or you probably get thrown out, right? That's what they're asking for. They want the whole truth. They don't want a half-truth. Half-truth doesn't work, right? We want the whole truth. If I told you, if you want to get to Fort Collins, you just get up here on Highway 14 and go about 20 miles to the west, that would be right, right? But if I fail to tell you, oh, by the way, about halfway there, the bridge is out, could be a problem, right? You could get hurt. Half-truth kills. That's the message of the Bible from Genesis 3 forward. And so we have a responsibility to give the whole truth. And when it comes to the gospel, which we love because it's the good news, right? It's what the word means. We often forget that there's a flip side to the gospel. And so as we look at the communication Jesus asks us to do here, I want us to see there are two pieces to it, two parts to it. There's the good news and then there's the bad news. We need to look at both and we need to be faithful to both. Now let's look at the good news and we'll spend most of our time here actually. There are two ways that we are to communicate the good news. We're to communicate it in deed and we are to communicate it in word. Look at verse nine again. Jesus says, heal the sick in it and say to them the kingdom of God has come near. There are two commands here if you look carefully. The first command is heal, the second one is say. Or another way to look at that would be to, that he's saying, do and speak. So there's action and there's explanation. Both are part of the communication that we do. Now their main job was to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus made that clear in many places. Not least of which in Mark 138 when he left a huge healing service to go out and preach the gospel in other places. Preaching is primary. But while Jesus was here and during the time that he gave these men special power to heal, that was also part of the, part of the process because it authenticated the message. It was a way of showing the reality of the message. Authenticating it. Now we don't have the same the same healing powers that they did. It doesn't mean we shouldn't pray for healing as we often do and sometimes see people healed, but we don't have the same kind of power that they did in this day and time on purpose. Jesus did this purposely for a period of time to authenticate. So what authenticates today? The New Testament, the Bible that they didn't have. We'll see it in Luke 16 so clearly. When Jesus will say, hey, listen, better than a somebody coming back from the dead is somebody reading the Bible. That's our authentication. So does that mean, okay, so Jesus is, God's now out of the healing business? Of course not. Complete healing of the body is part of the promise of God, just not necessarily right now, not necessarily in this life. But it's there so we don't want to be mistaken about that. God promises a resurrection when we will receive a body like unto his glorious body, Philippians 3.21. He says it this way in Revelation 21, verse 4, he, he tells us that death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So yes, a healed, restored, renewed body as well as a renewed soul is part of what we get when we come to faith in Christ. Just a question of timing. But in the meantime, unbelievers, those who don't know Christ yet, need to see the gospel in action. So how does that happen? 
We go to a lot of passages of Scripture to explain that, but let me give you probably, I don't know, the best one of all, Galatians 5, where he talks about what's the fruit of the Spirit? What's the fruit of the Holy Spirit who takes up residence in the life of every person who's a true believer? And if you go to Galatians 5, 22, 23, some of you perhaps memorize this at some point in your life, but you know the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, I know it in the King James, and I have to, these other versions, I have to read it. But it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What he's saying there is you live like that, and you're living the gospel. If we can allow the Holy Spirit to so overtake us, to so, you know, follow the instructions that he gives in in, uh, Philippians, in, uh, in uh, Ephesians 5.18 where he says, be con- constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. So this is what characterizes your life. We will be living the gospel with clarity. That's what we are to be looking for these days. You know, historically, Christians have done this. Christians have been at the forefront of providing hospitals where they're needed, of doing works that, that take care of those who are less needy, of creating char- uh, more needy, those creating charities for those who are less fortunate than we are. It's been Christians who have been in the forefront of all those kinds of activities historically. Why? Because they're so good? No, because the Holy Spirit compels us as believers to represent God and to represent the gospel in deed. It shows that God is interested in the whole person. Jesus didn't just come to save souls only, right? Jesus came to save people. Very few, I can only think of perhaps one other major religion that teaches that about salvation, that it involves the total person, but that's what the Bible teaches us about Jesus. He's interested in us, body, soul, and spirit. Robert Lewis, some of you remember him from the men's fraternity days that we went through here. He's sent in in the city of Little Rock, his church has sent out literally hundreds of service teams into the community around Little Rock and around the world. He says this, he says, pastors have given themselves to ministering only to the, to the pain of their congregation, but have failed to mobilize their congregations to minister to the pain and problems of the city. Either we learn to do both, or reaching our cities for Christ will be nothing more than a hope and a dream. And I think he's right. What he's saying is if we're not living out this gospel in formal ways and in informal ways, We're misrepresenting the Lord who's asking us to represent him. We're to look for ways to be that healing influence in our communities. Sharing the gospel starts then with living the gospel, right? Doing it in deed. But at some point it has to turn over and we have to begin to speak so that we also represent the gospel in word, deeds, not enough. It sounds good to say, well, I'm just going to, you know, I'll, 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 I'll do the best I can. I will live out the gospel. I'll be a, a good person and people will be able to see Christ in me. That's wonderful. It's a great goal. But the Bible makes clear that at some point we, got, we have to, you have to talk. It's through the power of the word that people come to salvation, right? Romans 10. It comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Lee Strobel who's becoming a contagious Christian evangelism uh, course. He's taught literally over a million people how to share their faith. And he says this about this focus on speaking in evangelism. He says, there are a lot of churches that have shifted from uh, just having an evangelism program to just saying, well, we're going to be service oriented now. We're going to do service projects and we're going to do things like that, which is again, good. But Is it enough? Here's what he says. He says, they did a lot of great things for the community. They didn't baptize one new convert in four years. He's talking about a specific church. He says, if we're merely nice folks who do good deeds for others, then we're nothing more than a Kiwanis club. 
is right. You can find good things going on out there. The question is, are we doing these in the name of Christ so that people understand what the motivating factor is about us? Now, in sharing the gospel, we've told you in previous weeks, one of the reasons we've gone through the verses that we've been going through, we've given you four or five verses in Romans that you could take and know how to share the gospel with somebody. Hope you're taking these home and teaching them to your children so that they're getting these into their lives. What's your first mission field? Your kids. It's the biggest mission field of any church is the kids that are there. And so we have to work on that. But what these are teaching is, I I see here three things that God is saying, Jesus is saying, I want you to, these are the things that you need to be communicating. You can only communicate these in words. And the first is the communication that God offers pardon. God offers pardon. Pardon. Pardon from sin. We don't talk about sin. We, have a, we live in a society that doesn't know about sin, but look what Jesus says in verse 8. He says, heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom, I'm sorry, verse 9, heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Say it. You got to say it. They don't know what came near if you don't tell them. So he says, say it. I want want them to know that this is the, when when they see in this healing and whatever, this is God's kingdom in action. This is, this is what people need to know, that God offers pardon for sin. That Jesus paid the penalty for our sins and that now we can be forgiven if we will just come to him in faith and accept his lordship in our life. It's free to those who will accept it. You say, where do you see that in this verse? Well, that's a good question. It says the kingdom of God has come near, right? But remember, remember this, remember that when the Bible summarizes, as it does like, for, for example, in Matthew 4, 17, the message of John the Baptist and of Jesus, both of them, the summary statement of their overall message is this, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's the repent That's the key to the whole thing. It's the repent that's the key to entrance. It's the repent that has to come first. Repentance triggers forgiveness. That's how we become part of the kingdom of God, right? And so when I see Jesus saying, tell them the kingdom of God has come, obviously part of that is to tell them, by the way, and the way you become part of that kingdom of God is to repent. Jesus warns in verse 13, For if the mighty works had been done in you that had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have, what? Repented long ago. Repentance is how we receive Christ and enter his kingdom. Beloved, the good news of the gospel is that that forgiveness is instantaneous. Our world knows nothing about that. And the, the first thing it does is try and deny it. And then the second thing it does is send you to a psychologist for, you know, five years to try and get rid of this. And the Bible is saying, no, 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 no. Yes, you do have a sin problem. And it's not a fake one, it's a real one. You have guilt because you are wrong. But you can be rid of it instantaneously. It's not that something you have to do penance for. It's not something you can work to merit. It's not something that you can somehow earn. You receive pardon from God when you come and ask for it in the name of Christ and confess your sins and say, I want to go a different way. Pardon for sin. That's good news. That's what Romans 8, 1 says, the the verse we just memorized, right? It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now. Not years from now. Not when you die. Not some later time when you've been able to work off all the bad stuff you did up to that point. Now, instantaneously forgiven, guilt gone. Do you realize how that message can resonate with our culture that is guilt-ridden from the top to the bottom? You can have forgiveness now. 1 John 1, 9, I realize it's written to believers, but it's equally applicable to unbelievers. If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a promise. The cleansing power of God. Sounds too good to be true. Just remember what it cost the Lord to provide it. And remember what we saw in Luke 9, what it will cost you to accept it. It's free, but your life has to turn around and go another direction, right? It has to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But in Christ, you can be like you never sinned. What a message. But people won't get it if we don't say it. Second part of the message, God offers peace. God offers peace. There's a message for our day, is it not? God offers peace. Whatever house you enter, verse 5, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. The Hebrew word was shalom. Most of you have heard that word. It's the Hebrew word for peace. It's, it's, it's a word that means wholeness. It's speaking of somebody who's integrated, someone who is at peace with God, peace within, peace with others, someone who kind of has it together. This is what the word shalom means, blessing to you. This is what I wish for you, that you be a person who is at peace all around. Now, by the time of Christ granted, it had become more or less a greeting, kind of like we say, have a good day, right? And yeah, we mean it, but it's just kind of a way of saying hello, right? And the word shalom was that way in the time of Christ. But when Jesus sends these men out and tells them to say peace to this house, it's not just a friendly greeting, beloved. They're bringing the real thing. They're bearing peace. They are peace bearers. True peace is a priceless thing, is it not? To be at peace, as elusive as the wind, really, in some ways. Thomas Merton tells us why. He says, it, he says it this way. He says, we cannot be at peace with others because we are not at peace with ourselves, and we cannot be at peace with ourselves because we are not at peace with God. I don't think any truer statement was ever made. It all starts with peace with God. But you see, these disciples are carrying the solution, their message, the message that they're bringing, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It anticipates the message the way Paul wrote it later when he wrote in Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have what? Peace. Peace with God through the only way it can come through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. That's what they were, that's what they were bringing. Repent. Because that opens the door to justification by faith. And justification by faith opens the door to peace with God. Pharisees, what was the best they could say? Do more. Do better. Get it right. And maybe, maybe you'll be okay. What's the message of the gospel? Give up doing and receive the gift of eternal life that Jesus offers, that God offers because of the death of Jesus Christ in our place. There's nothing like it. It's not wishing, it's not hoping, it's not thinking one of these days I'd like to have peace. It's knowing that I have peace with God right now, right today. I can be right with God. David Smith was one of the finest pit crew chiefs that was around in the 1960s, NASCAR racing. Some of you followed racing will be aware of him. He, he got heavily, though, into the, into the hippie scene that was prominent in those days. Some of us remember it well. He had the long hair. He uh, got into the trademark, trademark of, the, of the hippie scene, which was, of course, an overindulgence in drugs and in alcohol. His father, who was a new Christian, 
started talking to him and witnessing to him and trying to get him to understand that he needed to come to faith in Christ. And David just blew him off the way young guys will tend to do. He says, well, Dad, you know, someday when I get old, like you, you know, then maybe I'll give that, I'll get religion. His dad said, but David, what if, what, if you, what if you died tonight? You know, one of your crazy parties, or what if you wrecked your car tomorrow? Where would you be? And David said, well, I guess I'd be pushing up daisies. His dad said, David, your body might be pushing up David, uh, daisies, but you have an eternal soul which will be either in heaven or in hell. Let me know, just pushing up daisies. Well, he blew it off. It wasn't too many months. He was going on about this life, and he began to realize he was taking a little more drugs, a little more alcohol all the time to get the same buzz. And pretty soon, it really wasn't that much fun at all. And so he pulled out a Bible one day that his mother had given him, and he began to read in it. And she, you know, she'd, <laughs> typical mother, she'd marked all the right verses, right? Go here, go here, go there. Here's where you need what you need to see. And so he's so he reading that night, considering the things that he was reading there, and he called his home the next morning, and he got his mom, told, told her that, she, that he'd been reading that Bible, and she said, that's interesting, I've been up praying for you almost all night. You were just on my mind. Well, that was enough for him to decide. I, don't you wish it was always this easy? <laughs> it's not, but sometimes it is when the Lord works. He said, I decided it was time to put my faith in Christ. He confessed his sin. He invited Jesus to become the Lord of his life. And here's what he says about that. He said, I knew at that moment all the guilt was gone. The burden lifted off my shoulders and in its place a joy and a warmness and a complete peace came into my life right then. He was just experiencing Romans 5.1, right? Peace with God. His, his life wasn't perfect after that any more than any of our lives are perfect after that. But beloved, the big question can be answered and it can be answered now. Peace with God. The third thing that I see that Jesus offers here is paradise. God offers paradise. Perhaps you've noticed that God's, God's offers just keep getting better and better, Right? We're back to verse 9 again. He says, heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Let's concentrate now on that, just that phrase, the kingdom of God has come near to you. The kingdom, that's what every Israelite was looking for, right? The problem is they had been misled about how to qualify and to become part of the kingdom of God. They were just looking for an outward Messiah. They had missed the fact that God, even through the Old Testament, had, tell them, had been telling them you need to be you need to have your heart cleansed. You need, to have, you need to have circumcision of the heart. This had been constant, but they had missed it, and their leaders did not teach them this. And so, and so when the kingdom itself came in the person of the king, so close they could reach out and touch him, they missed it. What a tragedy. The very thing that they lived for, that they wanted more than anything else, right in front of them. And they missed it. What is the kingdom of God? At its core, and this will help you because when you, when you read scripture and you're trying to interpret and you come across these phrases, kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, they're, they're the same thing used interchangeably at times, just the word kingdom, at times it'll be perplexing because at times it seems like it's ethereal and over here and at times it seems like it's very political. What is it? So let me try and help you with that. The kingdom of God at its core, at its base, is the rulership of God anywhere, anytime, wherever he's made Lord. That's why the kingdom of God begins inside our hearts. That's why Jesus could say to Pilate later on, my kingdom is not of this world, even though it certainly is going to be of this world one of these days. At its core, it's the rulership of God in our hearts and our spirits because we give them over to his control. That's how it starts. And it arrives in our heart the moment we accept him and ask him 
to take over. The kingdom of God, in that sense, has come. That's why in the New Testament, sometimes it sounds like the kingdom's already here, and sometimes it sounds like it's yet to come. It is, it's both. It's, it's here, and yet it's not yet. The Jews didn't get that. They were looking just for this political kingdom without realizing that it starts within. And so that what they wanted was the political kingdom. They wanted all the benefits of that, but they did not want the rulership of Christ in their hearts. And yet, in seeing the miracles, they were seeing the power of, of, of the kingdom at work right in their midst. In seeing the disciples, they were looking at citizens of the kingdom right there next to them. And of course, in seeing Christ, they were seeing the king himself. So close they could shake hands with him. That's how near the kingdom was. When Jesus said the kingdom of God is near, he wasn't kidding. It was right there. But they missed it because they wouldn't accept him, because they turned away from him him. But for those who did come, what did they receive? They received pardon. They received peace. And they received the promise of paradise. What did Jesus tell the dying thief on the cross? What did he tell him? Today, you will be with me where? In paradise. The minute that reprobate that was hanging there and he would have only been there if he was kind of the worst of the worst. The minute that he stopped his mocking, because the Bible tells us that's what he was doing when he went to the cross, the minute he stopped that, the minute he confessed his sins, which he did, when he said to the thief next to him, listen, this man didn't do anything to deserve to be here. We deserved everything to be here. The minute all of that happened, guess what? Instantaneous pardon, instantaneous peace with God. And he was in paradise before the sun went down. It's nobody too bad to be saved by God. Paradise is for those who will accept Christ. It's the real deal. It's not just some ethereal promise out there. I'm going to have a service for Leela Kearns tomorrow to, me to memorialize her life here. You couldn't get her back here for anything. Why? Because she's in heaven enjoying the benefits of belonging to Jesus Christ. He promises paradise, and believe me, beloved, he delivers. And it makes a difference if we believe in that promise. I, it was interesting to read Tim Keller. Now this guy's a, he's a pastor, right? He's a great preacher in New York City. He had thyroid cancer at one time, and he was gonna have to undergo an operation. Now the prognosis was pretty good, but he said still, it's a, it's a cancer operation. <laughs> And he said, he said this, he said, I, 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 I was reading in Tolkien. He's, you know, he loves that kind of stuff. He's reading Tolkien in the third, uh, third book of the, uh, the Lord of the Rings. And he read this, when everything was going wrong and it looked like evil was going to win. And you've all seen the movie, right? So, you know, evil is going to win. And, he, and, he, and here's, what, here's what he read. Sam, one of the heroes, saw a white star twinkle for a while. The beauty of it smote his heart as he looked up to the forsaken land and hope returned to him. For like a shaft, clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end, in the end, the shadow was only a small and passing thing. That's this life, beloved. That's why C.S. Lewis called it the shadow lands, because that's where we live. The shadow was only a small and passing thing. There was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach, putting away all fear. He cast himself into a deep and untroubled sleep. And here's what Keller comments on that. He said, it's really true. It's really true. Because of Jesus' death, evil is a passing thing, a shadow. There is light and high beauty forever beyond its reach because evil fell into the heart of Jesus. The only darkness that it could have destroyed us forever fell into his heart it didn't matter what happened in my surgery. It was going to be all right, and it is going to be all right. And whatever you're facing, beloved, it is going to be all right. The big question is answered if you belong to God in the person of Jesus Christ. 
I know that many of you are facing difficult situations of one kind or another, you know, things that God is asking you to go through. What I want you to know is this, this is the shadow lands. Yes, it may hurt for a while. Yes, it's painful for a time. This is just the test. This is just the test. The reality awaits around the corner. He promises paradise. That's part of our message. Now, we've got to look for just a second at the bad news, the other side of the gospel. We're going to, unfortunately, we're, well, fortunately, we're going to get to some passages on hell before long here in the book of Luke, and we'll get into this in more detail. But the other side of the gospel is the bad news, and it's really simple. In order to get what God offers, you have to accept it. Does that sound simple? So, so what's the bad news? Well, if you don't accept it, you don't get it. If you don't... Invite him to be the Lord of your life. You don't have him and you don't have his blessings and you don't have any promise that he ever made. And so it says in verse six, and if a son of peace is there in this house, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. Jesus is saying you guys are the peace carriers. If people will accept you and repent, they will have peace with God, peace within and peace with others. But, if they turn you down, no peace anywhere. No peace. Verse 16, the one who hears you, hears me. The one who rejects you, rejects me. Think about that the next time you're feeling bad because a friend or somebody you thought was a friend or somebody out there is putting you down and you feel alone and you feel isolated and you feel dumb and they're they know all about the elite education and they, you know, they, 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 and, and you, just, you just feel isolated. Think about that. Think about what Jesus says here. If they reject you, they reject me. And the one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. What Jesus is saying is to reject the gospel of peace is to reject the one who brought it in the first place. Then it's to reject the Christ who paid for it on the cross. And finally, it's to reject the Father who arranged for all of it in the first place. Who oh. wouldn't want to be in those shoes, would you? Jesus says it'd be, it's going to be better for Sodom in the judgment than it is for those people. There is no peace without the Prince of Peace. To reject Jesus is deadly. Look at verse 10. Whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable in that day for Sodom than for that town. Wiping off dust from feet, as you know, was a means of rejection. It means as, as you have rejected me, so I reject you. But Jesus says, tell them, know this, the kingdom of God came very near. The kingdom of God came also close. It was right here. So close you could reach out and touch it and you rejected it. I think the worst part of hell will be the eternal realization that it was so close at some point in time that you could touch it and you turned it down. Eternal regret. Well, beloved, that's how close it is this morning. It's one heartfelt prayer away. If you don't have peace with God through the person of Jesus Christ, if you've never made that commitment to him, the kingdom of God is just as close this morning as it was to those people. It's one heartfelt commitment to the Lord that, who's provided it. It is at hand. But the question is, is it in your hands? Is it in your heart? I know what most of us think. I got plenty of time. 
We don't know if we have plenty of time, right? Guy goes to the doctor, he says, give it to me straight, I can take it. The doctor says, well, okay, if you want it straight, here's what I'll tell you. Don't buy any green bananas. Wouldn't want to hear that, would you? Don't buy any green bananas. You know, we hear that and we all think it's for somebody else. But may I remind you, there were around this country people who went out on Friday night to celebrate Halloween who never got home. They weren't expecting to die that night. They didn't think something could happen. I mean, the... It's heart-wrenching, the stories, right? I know, yeah, it's just a small amount, but do you, those stories get repeated every day. You don't, not, none of us, we don't know how long we have, right? So the wisdom is this pastor was teaching a class, you know, on repentance and on eternal life and on, on how to get right with God. And he said the way, to, you know, it, it requires repentance to get right with God. And the student said, well, when should we repent? And the pastor said, we should repent. The, if you're going to ask that question, repent the day before you die. Smart student said, well, how, how, how do I know what day I'm going to die? How does anybody know the day they're going to die? The pastor said, you don't, and you can't, and you won't. So accept him now. Don't wait. Urgency attaches to this, beloved. These decisions that we make that have eternal consequences. Let him in. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for the calling you give us to share with others. And we want to be faithful, Lord. We long to be positive and we long to be those who are bringing good news and so much of what we have to bring is overwhelmingly good news. And yet, always when you spoke it, you gave the other side too. There's, there's, there's the other side of the coin is very, very bad news. It's not like there's just heaven out there, there's also hell. And we're not faithful we're not telling the people about the bridge that's out halfway if we don't tell them that. So, Father, please use our meager efforts to, to, to represent you well, to introduce your name into the conversation, to raise questions in the minds of people. And if they're asking to take them to Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23 and Romans 10.9, so that they could have the gospel. And now Jesse's going to teach it to us in three more verses, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And we have those, we have the whole gospel. So help us to live it, but help us also to speak it, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.